Very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, and uh, welcome to uh, another webinar here with us. Uh, happy Thursday to all of you. Hope uh, you are all doing well, and we are trying to be as productive as we can. Uh, so let's uh, get rolling. This is going to be our R2 uh, webinar. Uh, hopefully, you have uh, you know seen us or joined us for the last couple of webinars we have done yesterday and the day before. This is the one that we focus just on productivity. Uh, I'm your one of your hosts, Sam Basu, and with me I have a whole bunch of uh, my good friends here. So let's just maybe go around the room and introduce ourselves. Uh, I'll start. I'm Sam, I'm part of the developer relations team, and uh, let's start with Rick. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Rick Elwood. I'm a principal sales engineer. I work with the .NET libraries, Telerik reporting, productivity tools, and all things Telerik. Perfect. And uh, Misho. Hey, my name is Mikhail Vladov, and uh, I'm the engineering manager of uh, JustMock. Perfect. So Rick and me are actually uh, in the Americas, East Coast time, but the rest of the folks here are in uh, Sofia, Bulgaria, and they happen to be together in the same room uh, right now. So how about uh, we go with Eve? Hey, everyone. It's exciting to be here in person. Uh, this is a new family, but my name is Eve Terzillo. I'm on the developer relations team with Sam, and I handle all things Fiddler, and that's what we'll be talking about today. Perfect, and Peter. Hey, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Peter. I'm part of the sales engineering team uh, here in uh, Progress, and I happen to know a little bit about uh, testing, UI components, design, and all things uh, Telerik. As Rick said. <laughs> perfect, perfect. All right, folks. So while you're going to see, you know, the four or five of us uh, on screen here during the webinar, uh, we do stand on the shoulder of giants. We just pushed out a huge release last week. Uh, so a lot of our engineering folks and, uh, you know, team members are also on the call. So uh, we thank you, you know, for your time, for, you know, uh, joining us here for the webinar. Let's utilize it so you get uh, you know the most out of it. Um, you know, so ask every questions as you as you go along. So we are all for you know developer productivity. We had the Telerik webinar, we had the Kendi webinar where we talked about UI components. You know, as developers, we are building apps. We uh, need to be able to have the right components so we can you know uh, not reinvent the wheel, ship our apps faster. But that that's just only one slice of the story. Uh, as you know, any developer you know life cycle uh, you know for apps go. Uh, we need DevOps, we need network profiling, we need reporting, we need testing, all of that together. We need, you know, unit testing and mocking. So that's kind of what we are going to dive into today. Um, so, uh, again, if you're just joining us for this webinar, maybe you missed a couple of things uh, last week. So maybe this is another, you know, call to action for you to come and hang out with us anytime, uh, you know, uh, throughout the months. Uh, but definitely, you know, before the webinars, right after the releases, we do hang out quite a bit on Twitch, which is where we do some live coding. We invite engineers folks to kind of join us and do some deep dives uh, it's very interactive so you know please come and join us we did so for this release a lot of these videos are up on YouTube so you know ping us anytime you need to uh, and uh, just to quickly go over what we have been covering so we started on Tuesday with the Telerik webinar which was all things .NET across web mobile and desktop uh, so in a big big release this time around and then yesterday we did the all things JavaScript release which was um, you know all things Kendi UI who, across Angular React jQuery, um, you know, view and so on. And today we get to talk about all things productivity. And to me, like this is the one that, you know, ties it all together because like without uh, any of these tools, you can't ship apps with confidence. So we're going to talk about Telerik Fiddler, Telerik Test Studio, JustMock and reporting solutions, all things together uh, for the next two hours. And we are, you know, delighted to have you on here with us. We did, uh, like I said, push out the release last uh, week and some of those products have like rolling release cycles. Uh, so if you care about a specific thing that you want to know, uh, check out our blogs, you know, every product team and uh, they take the time to write up exactly what uh, has evolved in this release. Uh, so, you know, please check that out. But, you know, while you're there and while you are here, um, uh, you know, look around at some of the other products. Maybe you already have Telerik DevCraft uh, and you could utilize some of these other tooling in your, you know, portfolio. Uh, 
so like I said, you are here. Let's utilize your time. You have a Q&A panel. Uh, we are all here to answer as many questions as we can. So fire away uh, questions on the you know webinar panel. If you are on the internet, so on uh, you know on the social Twitter verse, then uh, ask away questions using the hashtag #HeyTeneric. And you know if your connection drops, if you have a meeting, uh, anything like that, uh, we are recording this in high def, and we'll you know put this up on YouTube as uh, soon as we can. Uh, and everything we talk about today, you know, be with uh, reporting, uh, mocking, fiddler, and you know, testing, they are all you know hot bits as of last week, pretty much. So if you're not seeing some of the functionality we talk about, you need to upgrade uh, to the latest ones. And you know, you folks do uh, all different ways in which you integrate our uh, tooling in your you know workflows. So however you're getting our bits, go get them. Could be the download section uh, from your Telerik.com website or you know control panel uh, for a lot of things like you know. Uh, you know things like reporting and mocking those are all nougat packages you can just get them in any given project that you're working on so however you get the bits go get the bits uh, and uh, you know we always talk about this but we genuinely care for your developer experience uh, if we fail on any of these things we are failing you so we put a lot of love and care into this um, i have always loved our talks but you know keep telling us about more things that you want to see on feedback.telerik.com. That's where we are always listening. Uh, we have all of our demos up. And the docs site actually got a big refresh uh, this year uh, or this release. We have dark mode and light mode support. So however, uh, you know, it suits your needs and go ahead and use the docs. All right, uh, so with that, Let's switch to Fiddler time. And we are switching things up a little bit because like a lot of you want to know about Fiddler. Uh, so Eve is here. Uh, Eve, uh, let's talk about uh, Fiddler. There you go. Uh, but before we go into Fiddler and what uh, we have done with Fiddler uh, in the latest release, we do have a quick poll, you know, trying to keep things interactive for you all. So question here is, have you tried Fiddler everywhere? And do you know that Fiddler is a big family now? It's not just one product just, that just works on Windows. It's multiple things all together. Um, and where did you start with the Fiddler Everywhere journey? Have you used it in the last you know, six months? If not, then you really should. Uh, and so let, let's take a look at where you folks are, because you know, Fiddler has different um, you know, uh, you know, nuances. You might be on just uh, Windows. You might be using, you know, Fiddler Jam. But have you tried Fiddler everywhere late, uh, you know, recently? So uh, let's see where you all uh, are. Uh, going once, going twice, and thrice. Let's see your answer. Okay, uh, so Eve, you have uh, some folks to win over. Uh, I'm sure the folks who are using it are, you know, seeing all the benefits, but a lot of you have not um, used it, which is uh, the perfect time for Eve to come in and show you all the new things we have been doing. Uh, so let's uh, let's go back here and um, see if I can find my mouse. All right, there. So. Eve, tell me about Fiddler Everywhere, please. Of course, I've been waiting for the moment. Um, so I'm excited to be here with everyone here today. We um, joined the release, and for Fiddler Everywhere, this is 3.2. And since now we have that poll, uh, those answers available, I can really tailor the talk for a majority of the audience. So what Fiddler Everywhere is, it's a web debugging proxy, and it offers a pathway for all. So whether it's Windows, it's um, Linux or it's Mac OS, you can rapidly debug your network applications. And what's really cool about this is one, it's very powerful, but it's yet so easy to use. And I think that's one of the things people get a little overwhelmed when they see all of the functionality within Builder Everywhere, but you can tailor it for your exact needs. Uh, and that is one of the strongest selling points. It gives you that full visibility without a lot of added workflow or processes. It's very streamlined. Exactly. And, you know, Fiddler, uh, it, it's a family of products, like you say, uh, Eve, it's classic on Windows, but there's also Fiddler Core, which is the main engine, and then Fiddler Cap and Fiddler Jam are, you know, lightweight companion tools for your users to understand what's going on on their network stack. Uh, so uh, a little bit more about, you know, Fiddler Everywhere here. Uh, can you talk us through, Eve, some of the, you know, core features that folks can expect when they start using it? And uh, what are some of the you know, sharing uh, collaboration uh, features that we are being building up and you know what's new in this release? Right. Some of the main features that initially attract people to Fiddler Everywhere is that live traffic tab. So it allows you to see all of that network traffic coming in and some of those additional filters 
um, or additional features are like advanced filters, um, sorting, there's ways that you can create rules, you can do mocking scenarios. And then one of the other real key points is that sharing and collaboration. So let's say you do work on a team, you're not a solo developer and you wanna be able to share logs with people or investigate issues further. You have that built in collaboration without switching context. So everything is within Fiddler Everywhere. And new with our Fiddler Everywhere Enterprise subscription, we now have some really built in enterprise support. So SSO, bulk license management, so that is something new within the last year. And then we do have tons of upcoming features. That's one thing you can rest assured that the team, which is a dedicated team, is working hard to implement that user feedback. While we are very feature rich, there are some things and nuances that you guys give us back that we can implement to make the tool exactly what you like. And that's really important. The team is very customer centric. Yeah, and I like Fiddler everywhere, and I'm on a Mac most of the time. I like the fact that it's not just for web apps. It really is for any type of apps. As a native developer, I can do desktop, I can do mobile, I can do IoT, and I can see all of that traffic kind of go through Fiddler everywhere, which is really nice. Um, so let's talk about what's new, because you uh, folks just hit uh, 3.2 release, uh, right? So yes. uh, I see some big uh, things in here. Uh, you can now compare sessions, like multiple requests and responses side by side. So what's going on there? So we'll get into this demo, but what you're gonna be able to do is take two sessions from that same tab and compare them like you have in the image here side by side to see what is the same, what is different. Um, one is failing, one is not. How can I figure out You know what's what's gone awry. And now you have that ability like within this UI and you can see it's uh, very attractive, it's very intuitive, it gives you all the information at your fingertips. So it's a time-saving feature. Uh, this did come out in beta and in the future what we do is we plan to expand this feature to allow you to take multiple sessions in different tabs as well as in save sessions. So you know beyond just the live traffic. Nice. And what exactly is a rule before we get into other stuff here? So rules, that is something that what you can do is you can go in and put conditions to help you navigate through that traffic. So let's say you wanted to emulate a server drop. You can create a rule that does that on command. You can uh, also do, you know, delay requests. If you wanted to do a five millisecond, just to see how your app behaves in that scenario. Right, and it sounds like now we can, you know, run rules specific number of times, and that's a new feature. Yes. So what you nice. can do is you can say um, instead of just kind of like a one and done, and then reactivating it later, you can say I wanted to run three times, a hundred times, and then it gives you a counter too, so you can see what that looks like. Yeah, and one of the things that you said is if you are new to Fiddler Everywhere, the first time you, you know, start capturing traffic, it's a lot. It does capture everything, which is, you know, the point. Uh, but uh, filtering is really important for you to drill down on exactly the things you want to see, or even like with Rule Builder, where you're trying to build something specific. Looks like you folks have some autocomplete support and that the team put together. Yeah, that's always yeah. a big yeah. one. You know, just another time saving feature. Um, you know, it isn't going to be the breakout feature, but it's something that people are going to appreciate. No, I appreciate that a lot. Uh, okay, and case sensitivity, now you can control that. Uh, but looks like you did a lot more work on the security front, especially when it comes to certificates and you know, what's going on on the server side. Could you talk yeah. us through? Yeah, this has been something a lot of people um, find very tedious. Whether you know, they're responsible for their certificate management or their certificate chain, within the organization or they work with other sites, just kind of knowing the status, who's that issue, issuing authority. Uh, we also hard coded it so you can get a notification 30 days out if you're using a site that has one that's upcoming. So it's, again, just putting everything within the UI, giving you an easy path to find this information without having to put a lot of legwork in um, when you have a bigger job to be done. Yeah, you know, and for any web app these days, you, you have to have a certificate that's valid and it's signed to write and, you know, that's how you roll. But uh, you and me, like we were talking about it and the first time you showed me, like, I was like, oh, this could easily be something that, uh, you know, keeps track of uh, things that are, you know, about to expire. But, you know, uh, you could easily, you know, point fingers at, at other websites and say, oh, what's going on here? Because now you can yes. see all the certificate errors. Yeah. Very nice. And uh, the inspector looks like uh, it gets a little bit of updates as well. Yeah, that's another user feedback request item is being able to see that full URL. So you'll now see an eye icon 
um, and you can just hover over that and it gives you the whole URL and you can also copy that. So again, just giving you everything you need right there is saving you time. Um, same thing with like the sizing and timings. Um, that's also in that tab. So you can look from the start to the end time. It's also in the detail section. And then if you want to um, collapse or expand, you know, there's so much information there. Maybe you need it sometimes, maybe you don't. So right. that's what's nice about Fiddler. You get to pick and choose what you need when you need it, but you're rest assured that it's always there. Yeah, and as a, as a you know, mostly a mobile developer, I particularly care about the total size and the timing of requests and responses. So that's really nice to see that it shows a summary uh, for each request and response. So, uh, you know, without further ado, why don't we uh, look at some of this uh, in action? So, um, Eve, if you're ready, I am going to uh, give you the presenter rights so you can show us off uh, these features yourself. Perfect. All right, quick change of presenter rights here. Okay. All right, you're up. Okay, and can you see my screen here, Sam? Yes. Okay, so what I'm going to show you here, this is what I was talking about in terms of, let me just, hold on a second. Uh, the matching rules a specific number of times. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm going to that rule builder and I'm dropping down and you see a specific number of times and then here's where you can determine. I'm gonna use three. I'm using the example.com website and you can see the auto completion support came in. What I wanna do is change this to yellow and I go ahead and hit save. Now what I'm gonna do is go into my composer, again, using my example.com site. I'm gonna quickly just execute this request and go back to my live traffic tab and there you go. Yeah, so, so quickly, I mean, it, it draws your eye right in. Um, you know exactly what you're looking for. That took possibly five seconds, 10. Um, and then you can see where you have that counter there. So it was executed one out of three times. So this comes in like handy when you're testing applications like on unstable networks. Um, so you can test and see what the scenarios would happen, as I mentioned, like a server drop. Yeah, and I like the fact that even like when you're building up like a filter, you do get that autocomplete. Like let's say I want to focus on just this website and just this API that I'm hitting. I can only see that and it's just really easy for me to drill down. Yeah, and that's the point. You know, we want to, like you said, we want to try to make it easy for you. Um, yet we understand that you need a powerful tool in doing so. Right. right. All right, what's next? Okay, let's see what I'm going to show you next here. Um, this is that comparison of two sessions that we talked about. So here, I just highlight those sessions. I right click, um, go into compare and filter everywhere. And right there, you see it opens up a new tab. I have those URLs side by side. And then I can go over to the request section, um, look at the headers, params, and same in the response data. So it's the whole thing, like uh, everything that went into a request, uh, including the parameters, anything, uh, you know, caching wise, and then you want to see both things side by side. And maybe you want to know like, why is like one API call failing and why is the other one working? What's the right. difference? What, what's the difference? And what can you, did, you know, um, induce from that difference? You know, what is your takeaway that can help you get to your fix? Mm -hmm. Nice. And then the next one I'm going to show here, this is that certificate we were talking about. So right within um, the tab, you get that indicator. This one was green, but you go and this is where you can see that certificate tool chain in terms of the authority. And then there is an indicator. Um, let me show you the next one here. You can see here on this screen, I have those indicators over here on the left. So it lets me know there's a certificate error. So that message is now read and I can click on that to get all of those details. So you don't have to go out to a third party site, try to do some investigative work. You get to see right inside Builder Everywhere, everything's presented to you and then you can make those determinations of what, what your next step is um, if that falls on your plate. This is the same thing yeah. but with a certificate expiring, which I said was at hard coded 30 days. Um, I do expect you'll see that expand in future releases or maybe you can customize that to um, the duration that you feel comfortable with. 
Right. So if you are in charge of, you know, running an app and you're maintaining the certificates, now you get, you know, warnings to say, hey, something is about to expire. But, you know, how many times do we go to, you know, you know websites with more than everyone browsers and you get that same, you know, red warning to say, hey, something is not right. Now you know uh, exactly what is not right uh, with certificates. Yep, exactly. And then what I'm going to show you here is just that um, total sizes and timings. So right in that overview tab, you see here, you know, it's the um, 46 seconds. And then I can scroll down. I can also see those totals there and the response details, um, but in the timings and the sizes. Again, it's a visual representation um, as well as a specific number just to give you that quick reference if, if that's something that you need to pay attention to. Yeah, and, and this is critical, like uh, in today's day and age, like if we are building Blazor or Angular apps and we are shipping things and everything to the client side, we want to know exactly what is it we are shipping across the wire, what is being cached. Maybe you want to you know, check out, uh, make sure things are not being pulled down when they don't need to. And, you know, more for mobile apps, you really need to know about the timing and size of things that you're shipping. I agree. And it gives you an uh, indicator of where some optimizations could happen as well. Right. And this is where, you know, the other things that, you know, Fiddler Everywhere is really strong at could also come in. And, and I think you had mentioned this, Eve, like you could delay things by yourself. Like, you know, if there are X number of JavaScript files or CSS files you're delivering, you could delay them and, you know, try to simulate what, you know, bad network will do to your app. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like with Fiddler Everywhere, nothing should be a surprise, right? Because right? you can right. test all these different snares and make sure that you're in good shape. So it helps you deliver better software and deliver those more successful outcomes, yeah, avoiding absolutely. the repercussions. Absolutely. All right. This is the full URL I was talking about. So what you can see here is with that little eye icon, and it gives me that example.com. You click it, and the link is copied. I mean, that is so easy. Before, you could see like an excerpt of it, but now you get that full URL. So if you need to use that for... Um, you know, some of your documentation or other things you have that available uh, without any extra effort. Well, and also like in any, you know, modern sites, we have so much of, you know, query strings that that's carried over some of, you know, the credentials of how the user is coming in might be on the URL itself. Uh, so you, you have an easy way of, you know, copying that out and just taking it to a composer and rebuilding that request response yourself and then, you know, tinkering with it if you need to. Yeah, this is that time-saving shortcut that came from users, you know, users who are using the product and actively providing feedback, which we really do value. Nice. I'll show you here. Now I'm going to switch gears real quick. Um, just a Fiddler Jam, just give everyone a little preview. I know we've talked about Fiddler as a family of products, but Fiddler Jam is our support team troubleshooting solution. So it's comprised of two parts. It has a Chrome extension as well as a portal. So you work with your end users and your team also has something. So we came out with a, a preview of recorded logs. And I just want to show this quickly, how you, that here's that browser extension I can capture. So what I'm trying to do is reproduce, sending this to an end user who needs to reproduce a bug so I and the support team can reproduce it and give them a fix. But now what you can do is you can preview this before you send it off, just giving the extra layer of security or confidence that what you recorded is what you want to send off. And right there you and have I the also, link. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, on this front, I wanted to mention, uh, Eve, I really appreciate the team putting in the work on both sides, like thinking about the end user uh, in terms of, you know, privacy concerns. You have a whole bunch of, you know, things you can turn on and off because it does actually record your screen while you're doing that. Uh, so maybe there's something you you don't want to ship, so you want to you know pull back. Uh, but then uh, once you are happy, like I, I love the fact how the scripts and then the request responses kind of go in sync with the video uh, of of your actual screen. So that's really helpful for the support team to kind of dig in and figure out what's going on. Yeah, the video has been a great feature, and as you mentioned, it, it does have you know built-in security with um, data masking and you know, a secure portal. So they're all of those things where that is kept in mind and built by design to be the way it is. Yeah, and I mean, and no longer do we need, like you said, like you should never be in doubt, right? And also like when we talk about, you know, uh, support teams being like the first frontier, like um, before things get escalated all the way up to your engineers, and there's definitely something you need to fix, like 
now you know exactly with full fidelity what's going on on the user's computer. It's not like it works on my machine, but then you can't reproduce. Now you have exact logs that prove exactly what's going on. Yes, and there's a lot coming with this. Um, there's talks about Jam Embedded, so that would allow you to embed this functionality uh, within your web application with like a code mm -hmm. snippet. Uh, we're talking about uh, like a JIRA integration. So there's a lot of things that are um, not that far out. So if you haven't checked out Fiddler Jam as part of the family, I do recommend it. it you know, it is not their separate products. They do work complementary together. So you may see a need for both, um, but I definitely want to try to, as we said, people here aren't as familiar with Fiddler Everywhere. So Fiddler Jam is the newest product of that family. So I would recommend, there's a lot of great resources on our website. Yeah. All right. What else? Those are the main things I wanted to highlight today. Uh, I really want people just to realize that Fiddler is not, it's easy, it's not hard to get started with. I think sometimes it can appear overwhelming just because it is so feature rich when you show that list. Uh, but like I said, you can pick and choose what you want and it really does save you time. Um, and I've heard it recalled, you know, referred to as a Swiss army knife or a real time saver or a must have tool. And these are coming from, uh, developers you know who we aren't prompting for the feedback so i think that's a testament itself yeah and you know software development is really uh, you know a one-man thing it's it's a team sport right so i love the fact that you know just the way you have it here like you're copying that link out and you're opening it up in fiddler everywhere and now you can share that you know uh, session with your other team members and you can all dig in and see you can save those request responses you can compose you can you know tweak to your heart's content uh, it's it's very friendly to teams working together. All right, uh, so that's that's about Fiddler, and that's uh, quite a bit. Uh, anything else, uh, Eve, you want to mention? Well, the, um, myself and the Fiddler team are going to be traveling a little bit here now that events are opening back up. So we'll be at some big events coming up, like Kansas City Developer Conference, that conference, um, and some more. So if you're, you know, planning on attending any of those or have any upcoming shows more likely will be there or Sam will and please stop and say hello to us and we'd love to talk. Uh, no, I am really appreciative of what the Fiddler team and you folks have all done together. It's, it's so nice to see Fiddler everywhere. It was pretty much, you know, started from scratch and uh, getting to such a feature rich product in a short amount of time. It's really amazing to see. Yeah, it's, it's fun to be part of it and it's very yeah, impressive and, the work they're putting in. Absolutely. And, you know, folks, keep talking to us. Uh, we are we are listening. The team uh, listens to every piece of feedback that you give us. So, you know, keep talking to us and we'll keep making it better and better for you. All right. So um, let's do a switch off gears. And, you know, Eve, thank you so much, you know, uh, for showing us all of the latest uh, cool things. I, I can't keep up with Fiddler anymore. It's moving too fast for me, but it's great. It's great. Well, thank you. I appreciate okay. you giving us the platform to work from. Absolutely. All right. Quick switch of gears here. Let's see. Uh, we are right around the half an hour mark. Uh, you know, we have four big things to talk about uh, in two hours, which is not much time. So, you know, probably 20, 25 to 30 minutes for each one is what we're doing. And I see the switch of cameras. Peter is ready with his official Kendo UI shirt. Let's talk testing. Because without this, we have no confidence in what we are ship, uh, you know, shipping. Automation is key. Uh, so, Peter, thanks for taking the time. And uh, you know, uh, I, I want to learn more. Uh, there is so much about testing that I don't know. But let's start with all of you with a quick uh, poll. Quick question, trying to see where all of you are. So, test automation is what we're going to talk about. But are you doing it? Uh, if so, how? And if not, why not, right? So uh, have you taken a look at what we can do with uh, you know, Test Studio and the dev editions? Um, but uh, how else are you doing it? Um, are you actively looking at uh, tools? Uh, you don't know where to start. Uh, maybe, you know, Peter can convince you here because uh, there's a lot. This is, you know, another uh, gigantic area you're getting into with, you know, lots to do. And you need the right tools uh, to do the right things, you know, for your dev teams as well as for your QA. It's all one tight loop, you know. Uh, so we want to be as efficient as possible. So let's see your answers. Going once, going twice, and let's see the poll results. All right, uh, Peter, you're going to be happy with this as well. Uh, most people, 41%, are actively looking at this. Uh, you know, some 
need some convincing. You don't know where to start, which is also, you know, uh, a, a, you know, a challenging problem because you don't know where to start. It's, it's a big thing to take on testing and, you know, automating things for your teams. So let's uh, let's switch to, uh, you know, Peter telling us all the things about uh, test automation. So uh, okay. let's see if I can find my mouse again. There you go. Okay. First thing is, what is automated testing? Why should I do it? All right. Uh, thank you, Sam. And uh, first, uh, thanks Eve, uh, for the amazing uh, presentation beforehand. Uh, I'm curious, by the way, uh, Sam, just as a quick question towards uh, those guys who voted that manual testing does uh, the job for them. I'm curious if you can uh, shout out in the in the chat. Uh, how do you guys manage and do regression if you do everything manually? It's a quick uh, additional question for you. And uh, yeah, as, as Sam, to, to answer yourself. So what test you does? In a nutshell, in the so-called um, elevator pitch, uh, here it's um, try to think of it as an end-to-end UI automation uh, tool that would do the job to cover your functional testing from end-to-end. -end, um, doesn't matter what kind of technology you use. If you have a web application and uh, a WPF desktop application. What do I mean by it doesn't matter what kind of uh, technology you have for your web apps. As soon as your web app would run in a browser, we would recognize it. As soon as there is a DOM opened and fired up, we'll get to know all the elements and we will do our best to automate those elements in order to create uh, some scripts that you can run repeatedly until you make sure that you're bugless and you can go calmly uh, and safely to, to market, right? And avo avoid any discrepancies and angry customers. This is what uh, actually all of us strive to do uh, today. Yeah. In addition to that, yeah. No, I, I was going to say, like, yeah, that, that that's very true. But you know, to to your uh, you know earlier question about you know, if you're doing manual testing, I think that's kind of where a lot of people start. And I think that's fine, but you quickly see uh, what you're taking on, and it's just not scalable. Uh, for you know more apps, scaling scaling is definitely an issue, which result which results to investing into more time and resources. And you know how this uh, circle uh, starts uh, there. So the more time you need, the more resources you need, the less uh, time to market. And after all, maybe you not have that many happy customers. Or team, or even team members, uh, to say internal team members, the guys who develop and uh, maintain the, the product itself. Uh, sure. And everybody has a seat on the agile DevOps table. Talking about team members uh, here, this actually my favorite slide. Um, thank you, Sam, uh, for that. Uh, why do we say that everybody has a seat and um, on the agile DevOps table? So think of Test Studio as a tool that would, uh, of course, solve and create those UI automation functional tests for you. Uh, but you know, the team, the development team is not only the QAs, right? Or the BAs or the guys who are responsible for testing. Uh, there is uh, the development uh, part here and Test Studio exists in several editions here. Uh, what you're going to see a little bit later during the demo is the so-called standalone edition of uh, Test Studio that exists as a separate desktop application that you install on your premises, right? But Test Studio also exists as a Visual Studio plugin. It means that as a developer, if you are involved into testing by any means, you can continue working into your context into Visual Studio and still create or modify automation tests or just help the QA team by creating some helper files and maintaining them and what's not. So we have the developers as well. We have the managers, uh, the guys who every five minutes ask if everything is okay and uh, if the project is going well. So we test studio and it's a separate um, executive dashboard reporting, kind of reporting solution. You can check on the go dynamically as your project evolves, how the test lists are going, what are the results, and what is the overall health of your entire project? Um, by means of looking at this uh, executive dashboard, you can create fancy report definitions out of that. So we have the managers on the table as well. And, and talking about all of these uh, products uh, today, like uh, Fedora and JustMock and testing, you know, we are part of the big testing family here. So our products talk to each other, uh, not only those, but we talk to the UI components as well. We're going to talk about later on about the translators and so on and so forth. Uh, but the main products involved into testing, debugging and uh, mocking 
talk to each other and you see the big picture and you have all you need in order to create a unit test it in order to create a fully functional UI test and to debug your application uh, if you want. Yeah, so we have those guys as well. Yeah, and why do I why do we say agile DevOps, uh, DevOps uh, table? You know, latest and greatest trends at the moment uh, for whoever is practicing CI and CD uh, development. Test Studio can be plugged virtually into any solution that exists out there for um, CI CD uh, stuff by means of direct integration or by just running the test uh, the test lists via the uh, via the CI, which means that ideally when you sit down and you trigger your pipeline with your build or release the automation tests will start afterwards so that you sit down relax and do this uh, automation that we're all striving for so. yeah that's a lot of things you said and uh, there are some very key things in here I, I like the fact that you can roll uh code less if you if that's what you want to start with but yeah i really like the coded tests as well you know coming from a dev background uh, and you know, uh, you know, last release you folks did a lot with the CI/CD pipeline. I, I loved the fact that you can run headless tests now in like Dockerized containers. That's just so fast of a you know cycle. You're you know uh, literally this is a part of your CI/CD. You're not even thinking about it. You're checking in code and you're 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 firing away tests. So that's that's really nice to know. But uh, tell us a little bit more about you know um, how we are you know bringing value test studio. Uh, particularly with you know the things that uh, we build uh, UI component wise because you're trying to provide that continuous value uh, across the entire cycle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, yeah, Test Studio gives you all the abilities whether you want to go full coded testing if you want. Not that I would entirely recommend that or full codeless testing with the so-called point and click recording. So regardless if you're using the tests uh, codeless uh, or coded way or with or without any CI CD integration, even Docker integration that we introduced uh, a release uh, ago, we give you the options, right? It's up to you to decide. But the real additional benefits that Test Studio gives you is that, um, you know, the entire family, we're actually one family of all the products that, that Eric um, uh, presents, the UI components and the, um, the different tools talk to each other, uh, right? So Test Studio in particular recognizes our own UI. Uh, components. If yeah, your give application me a, is... give me a slide right after this, maybe. So, like, we we will do everything else, but like you're saying, like, if you end up using Telerik or Kendi UI, we are particularly good with our own stuff. Yeah, we recognize it thanks to the so-called translators, and you guys are going to hear a lot about translators uh, today when we talk about Test Studio and what's latest and greatest in it. But we recognize our own UI, and we give you those additional benefits that save you time and effort. For example, a very cool and basic example here, but very useful. There is a grid with a bunch of um, data inside it, uh, rows, and this grid might be grouped or sorted or not. Test Studio recognizes the Kendo UI grid or the Blazor grid or the, the Telerik UI grid, and it can check for you and verify if this grid is sorted, if it is grouped, how many um, data items there are in the grid. It comes out of the box without you doing anything you just need to select the corresponding option and uh, there it goes this is the great additional benefits uh, which you have uh, when you use the same vendor for the ui components and the automated testing uh, solution of course it doesn't mean that you don't use the Lyric ui for your application that we would not be able to automate it on the contrary we recognize any web ui that would um, exist out there and we will give you plenty of options to build a strong bulletproof um, automated tests, regardless of the technology that uh, exists out there from the old school .NET web forms until latest and greatest Angular, React, Blazor, and so on and so forth. Yeah, but I want to dig into like how you're actually pulling this off, you know, for Telerik and Kendi UI bits. Um, so you mentioned translators a few times. Uh, what exactly mm -hmm. is this? So the bus, magical buzzword of translators, I think of it as a special extension that exists into Test Studio that opens up the element and recognizes that it's a Telerik or Kendo UI element. And you know, the way Test Studio is a point and click recording tool in order to automate your application, 
we capture your application DOM, the application structure, and we identify your elements based on their attributes like ID and uh, name and source and href uh, and whatnot, right? So whenever this, these special extensions called translators recognize our own UI elements, we fire up those additional benefits. As you can see here into the slide, this is a beautiful blazer grid, and you guys can see this uh, little purple icons. That is, it means that it's our own uh, UI. It's color coded like blazer is um, uh, purple, and Kendo UI is orange, and it, um, so on. And it gives you those. Uh, benefits as you can see here we recognize three different elements the grid itself the data cell and the data uh, item uh, inside it no coding or at least it's very low code needed in order to to do that ultimately it boosts your productivity because you save time and effort checking uh, and creating stronger ui optimization tests yeah, and I particularly like the fact you're color coding things, you know, purple for Blazor, orange for Kendo UI. That's perfect. And green um, for .NET. <laughs> oh, there you go, green for .NET. All right, so uh, have, have these been around or, I mean, it looks like you have a, you know, big uh, thing that you did recently about versioning uh, and backwards compatibility, <laughs> but translators mm -hmm. aren't, you know, brand new. I mean, they have been the ones that are, you know, you've been using under the covers. They've been around for quite some time. Uh, exactly, this is a very important feature in order to give you this additional boost of uh, productivity. But we as a company in general, we listen to our customers' feedbacks and uh, requests for each of the products. You know, we have those feedback portals when all of our customers can uh, publicly share their requests. And the most popular one naturally goes uh, into scheduling eventually. So uh, to be honest, with regards to, to testing and test studio, we had this uh, quite popular request in order to introduce different versioning of those uh, translators. And why do I mean different uh, versioning? And why actually do you need uh, that? We're not talking uh, right now about how often you need to update your application. And by the way, I'm mentioning this every time I have the possibility our colleague Rick here has a very beautiful blog post uh, about that, uh, how how often and why sh you should update your app application. And we're not talking about the, only the new browser editions and security improvements and so on and so forth uh, that make you update your apps. But sometimes due to maybe introducing some uh, breaking changes or what, you can't update and keep the update of your applications that quickly. And, and what happens, it means that your QA department would might or might not be that happy from this fact because there would be a discrepancy uh, between the latest UI component that you're using into your application and the versioning of the translator into Test Studio, this special extension that recognizes this translator, which means a very good and valid example is that such discrepancy might result into a failing uh, test if you very quickly update your application UI, but don't uh, update the automation testing script. And that's why we listened to our customers and uh, introduced versioning of the translators, meaning that purely technically you can choose from Test Studio, and we're going to see this uh, during the demo, the corresponding version of the UI component that you are using into your application, and Test Studio will fire up the exact translator version for this component so that everything would uh, work fine in the scripting. Yeah, I like this because I, I think it's real because like as much as we would want uh, everyone to use the latest and greatest bits, sometimes you are, you're supporting a business. Your app is business critical and, uh, you know, you might be using a version one or two uh, behind the, uh, you know, the latest and greatest. So now you can, you know, choose which version and also you have, you know, can you can go back and look at uh, compatibility. So why don't you, Peter, show us uh, what you're talking about. Uh, so Demo let's... time. Yeah, let's make you the presenter here. Uh, if I can really quick. There you go. We should be ready to see your uh, desktop. Uh, you should be able to see Test Studio, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. This for for the for the ones who are seeing the two uh, for the first time, as uh, uh, we discussed, it's a WPF application that you install on your premises, and this is how it it looks like. So. If we go to the project and it's uh, 
properties, which is the most essential part. Um, remember, this is how we recognize your application in order to automate it. It has a bunch of uh, each of the components uh, have a bunch of properties like IDs, name, source, href. Uh, this is what we're looking for. If we want to click a button with Test Studio, we're looking for its ID. If we cannot find its ID, we're looking for its name and so on and so forth until there is a stable uh, property. Don't worry, by the way, I know a lot of applications have dynamic IDs. If you don't like it, just put it on the bottom and maybe the name is the most stable attribute of your uh, components or actually add a custom, custom one in order to, to automate it. So those UI components and those controls and their properties live all along with the translators, which by default, of course, are enabled from the settings in Test Studio. And as you can see, they are divided into three main sections. Yes, there is still Silverlight uh, here supported, HTML, desktop, and Silverlight. Each of the product families is there. And as you can see, for each of the product uh, family, there is a specific UI component and a translator for it, right? Which you can enable or disable. Of course, I would uh, gladly recommend, strongly recommend that you keep all of those guys switched on, which is done by by default, right? The new thing that which uh, we have introduced here I, is I, I like that the versioning. Down. Yeah, <laughs> right. The versioning is here on a very visible place. Currently, we go back uh, as far as R3 2021, which is already three or four releases um, back, right? So you can select it and don't worry about that. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the semantics and the versionings of the different product families are a little bit different, right? And don't worry remembering. So what exact version is behind R1 2022, for example? All you need to do is just uh, follow up this uh, link, which will take you to our online documentation. And you can see for yourself a match between the versioning and the product uh, in question. So we got you covered here, but you, all you need to do is select the correct one. And for the sake of the demo, I have uh, selected the oldest version here, which is uh, R3 2021. Just a quick note, if you want to change it, the change will be applied only after you restart Test Studio. Right, so we keep this in the question and I have a pro Project uh, which is built uh, with our Kendo UI for jQuery uh, components uh, from uh, three or four versions uh, behind. Now, what I want to quickly show you guys is this little test here for the Kendo input that was created. I'm going to start it with the test studio annotator on, which means that the execution speed will be slowed down. Uh, so we can all see what's happening in, in the screen as um, uh, some mentioned we have several modes of execution, uh, including headless mode, which will be extremely quick, uh, but unfortunately not useful for the demo because you guys are not going to see anything since uh, the UI of the browser will not be fired up. It will go into headless mode, right? But for the sake of the demo, I am using and automating this uh, input field entering uh, a date, right? And some country uh, country names. As part of my uh, demo application and um, the test should go in um, in a sec and works totally fine with the corresponding version of uh, our Kendo UI that uh, that we have right and so while this is running Peter can I ask you mm -hmm. a, a tricky sure. question here because uh, I don't know the answer actually. Because uh, chat room, uh, and this may have been already answered. I'm just you know trying to read out loud so we can benefit. And we'll get back to some of the Q and A towards the end as well. But really quick, uh, Philip Schaefer was asking if Test Studio uh, works with websites running on Edge in IE compatibility mode. There shouldn't be any issues as far as uh, this is concerned. So basically, and if we go to to the settings of uh, Test Studio. Let me just uh, show it for you. Uh, basically, we support all the most popular browsers that um, exist out there, including uh, 
Edge, Chromium Edge, and IE. IE is still, still supported by Tesla. You can see here, you can choose it for both recording and execution. So uh, if you ask me at the moment, I would definitely say yes. Uh, but of course, as a rule of thumb, before you try it yourself and uh, see how it so, see how it goes, you don't want to give any false expectations and stuff here. But there shouldn't be any issues at the moment. We also support uh, support Safari in in Windows mode. Now that I can uh, demo it uh, for you guys, I, I don't think it's supported uh, any longer in Windows, anyways. But if you can run it, we would support it as well uh, for this. So no issues if you ask me. Or that yeah uh, all right we, we, we also offer like free hugs if you're having to support ie6 still but you know that, that might be the reality <laughs> that would be a little bit of a stretch right uh so what i just did in in the meantime i switched to a project that um includes latest and greatest in kendo ui so it means that we we supposedly updated our uh, demo application and what actually happened here is for this specific component, which is called uh, Kendo Input, we changed uh, in Telerik, the Kendo UI team, uh, changed the way text is, the way we got the text into the input field itself, which means that it's a real life uh, scenario here in case that if you are too quick to update your application and not the testing script itself, including the translator, without this versioning that we have introduced, there is a high probability that your testing script fails. And you know, in real life, you don't have one testing script. You have multiple, you have dozens, even hundreds of testing scripts. You have them incorporated into your CI, CD pipelines. And all of a sudden you go to work one morning and all of your reports go into the red because you have uh, some issues uh, there. And that's where the panic starts, right? But with the versioning of the translators, we would avoid such scenarios, as you can see here, we failed our script, failed on the second step because this is where the, the breaking change was uh, introduced. And I'm using the latest version of my Kendo UI, but actually into the settings, I am using my old translator. Uh, here, in order to fix uh, anything, I always like to say you can do all the fixes with a few clicks of uh, the button. You can switch to the latest versions of the translators. And by the way, since we are here, another change in test audio that would require a reboot of the tool is uh, theming. We support, since a few version back, we support uh, both white and dark themes, right? In order to switch uh, between them, you also need to restart the tool, and I can do the do the switch uh, as well. Restart the tool. I think this is more maybe uh, in line with what reality might be. Like we might have our test scripts, but then the app itself maybe may have been upgraded to the latest bits, and now all of your testing is just all red because they are failing. Uh, but all you have to do is, you know, go in the test studio and flip the version. Um, maybe we do a quick switch here and we'll let, you know, Peter come back and, uh, you know, uh, follow up from where he left off. Uh, I know there's Misho and Rick uh, waiting in the wings to talk about, uh, you know, just mock and reporting. So uh, why don't we do a quick switch here? Uh, let's uh, go back to me for a second. All right. So, yeah, I think... Um, uh, Peter's, uh, you know, maybe, oh, you're back, okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, are you ready to share screen and get back in again? The risks or? of the live broadcast, for, for some reason, go to have an arbitrate me and uh, decided to to restart. I just wanted to, to show you the changes that were that uh, were applied into the test studio. The, the new translators uh, versioning are here. As you can see in the dark team was, uh, uh, yes, was so it, and it did honor your dark theme, but you had to restart the whole uh, app. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and basically, this is just if you if you have a minute uh, more here, uh, Sam, I wanted yeah, to yeah, uh, talk about one other setting. Uh, actually, this is just a setting that we, a uh, default setting that we changed uh, here, no new functionality, no new features uh, here. You were talking about that previously, by the way, the way modern URL built, uh, Currently, back in the days, um, you know, we have those compare mode options here uh, in Test Studio. So back in the days, uh, full path and query was pretty uh, popular and uh, 
strong. Uh, but currently, the way URLs are built, imagine if you have, if you're testing different uh, environments like um, testing, staging, production, and so on and, uh, and so forth, right? Uh, the compare mode, if uh, if it was using the old default setting full path and query, it would it might create some issues and stuff. That's why we decided to change the default setting to full path only in order to ease you when you create uh, the scripts. And of course, you can change this at any point of, uh, of time from the test studio uh, settings. Right. And this was also one of the popular demands that we had from our um, community here and internal team members as well. Right. Cool. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's about latest and greatest with um, with test studio. Yeah, a uh, quick question here, which I think you have already mentioned uh, one time, Peter, but uh, Tom Daria in the Q&A chat room was asking uh, you know, if Test Studio is only for uh, apps built with Kenda UI, uh, does it work for any regular website? And you know, the answer is yes, it absolutely does. Like, we will recognize all the HTML elements and, you know, give you, you know, context menus, but uh, it's like uh, if you do use end up using our UI, we just note those UI that much better, so we can give you extra context menus and extra things you can do with Blazor or Kendi UI or .NET uh, tools. Absolutely, any web UI, full WPF desktop UI, and additional testing with regards to Walton and for performance and the rest for API testing, post responsive web testing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Peter, thank you uh, and the team okay. for doing all that you're doing uh, every release uh, to make test automation, uh, you know, come closer to the cycle. And this is, like you said, this is all part of your, uh, you know, app dev life cycle, how you test, how you ship, how you debug, how you unit test, it's all coming together. Very cool. Um, all right, so let's do uh, let's do a switch up here uh, and let's talk about mocking and unit testing here. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen back up again, which looks like I can. Uh, let's talk just mock and hey, Misho, uh, good to see you. Uh, so uh, you hey. have been super busy because uh, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, in just mock and you know as uh, Rick is you know patiently waiting I am just amazed that we want to be you know bleeding edge and now the wide angle camera is back good to see you all uh, you folks are pushing on not just the present.net but you know moving ahead future facing as well so really cool to see uh, but before we start uh, Misho what is just mock well just mock uh... Very quickly, is uh, a mocking framework. And how do you use a mocking framework? Well, you use it when you write uh, unit tests. And in the particular, when you want to isolate uh, uh, the code that you want to test from its dependencies. And uh, what are those dependencies? Let's say it could be a connection to the database or some query or uh, consuming some um, REST service or something else. And uh, if so if you're using uh, such uh, uh, resources, such dependencies, you quite often need to uh, go around them and uh, to, to try to isolate them. And uh, this is uh, uh, something uh, that uh, JustMock uh, can handle. Uh, you can actually mock uh, a call to a particular method and uh, you can uh, mm, set an expectation what that uh, method will do when a call to it uh, will happen. So you can return from that method, uh, let's say a different value. You can just record that this method is uh, executed. This is uh, particularly useful uh, if you want to track uh, how many times a uh, particular method is executed, because if it needs to be executed just uh, twice in a particular court order, uh, you can find out that uh, it's executed much more times. So with that, yeah, you can, yeah. Yeah, you can verify it. Well said, and and the key word that you said in there was isolation. You you have to be able to isolate methods, and you know maybe it's a database call, maybe it's a web service call, to be able to mock and just you know come up with what your expected uh, answer is. Now uh, you and the team have been busy because uh, uh, if you have a, a generic interface and then lots of uh, you know, uh, child classes which inherit off that interface and then have their own implementations. Uh, now you're saying you can do something on the default implementation, correct? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, some uh, versions of uh, C Sharp uh, ago, I think that it was uh, C Sharp 8, uh, Microsoft introduced the uh, default implementation in the interfaces. And uh, sadly, until now, we, uh, we uh, couldn't um, mock uh, such a method that has a default implementation in the interface. And uh, with this release, uh, we have uh, implemented it and uh, yeah, we, we, we are now supporting it. Very nice. And uh, looks like you have also made it easier for me to quickly mock a method, like there is a new context menu where I can uh, fire this up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, this mock is trying to, to, to help you be um, much more productive when you are writing unit tests. And uh, with that, we, we try to uh, to allow the developers to, to write as few uh, lines of code as possible. And with that uh, uh, generation, creation of mock of a particular method from the context menu inside Visual Studio, uh, we are trying to, to reduce the, the code that developer is writing even, even more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the, the next slide here that you uh, gave me, like, I, I felt I was, you know, fairly, uh, you know, uh, keeping up with the times and modern run times. And then I met all of you folks who are way ahead of the curve because you're bleeding edge, you're looking ahead. Uh, so last release, uh, obviously, like with Visual Studio 2022, uh, you have had support for VS 2022 and, you know, the latest and greatest with C Sharp 10. But sounds like you are also moving uh, forward with .NET 7. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, we have uh, introduced support for .NET 7 Preview 1. And uh, yeah, uh, everything is working uh, as expected uh, uh, for now. Sadly, with uh, the Preview version 2, uh, Microsoft introduced some new changes. So uh, we will probably introduce it uh, in the next uh, few months. And of course, for the official version, an official release of uh, .NET 7, we will uh, provide uh, support. And this is, just to be clear, this is months out. This is, you know, early days of .NET 7. Um, yeah. .NET 7 comes out November of 2022. So it's good to see the team already, you know, trying out all the latest things and making sure uh, we are we are compatible. All right, so uh, Misho, let's let's look at what you're talking about with default uh, interface implementations. So I am going to bring up uh, your screen here. Yeah. Okay. So this is Visual Studio 2022. You're you're showing us things in. Yeah, this is uh, Visual Studio uh, 2022. Uh, nice. Yeah, and uh, this is the uh, default implementation of interfaces. We have an interface. Uh, which is a method with uh, some body in it that is doing some job. And with uh, just mock, uh, you're just using it uh, the same way you uh, actually, uh, I am creating a mock of a, a class that is inheriting that uh, interface just for the sake of the CTO. And uh, you are creating the mock uh, as you will always do with a mock create and then you are arranging that uh, particular method multiply values and in this case we want to return a value of 10 and if we run that test of course everything is executed let's just wait a few seconds until the this test uh, and it while it's coming, running, uh, uh, Misha, yeah. can you remind me of the big optimization that was done last uh, release? Yeah, the big optimization actually uh, can be uh, started from here. And uh, the on-demand on uh, instrumentation, instrumentation. Yeah, mm -hmm. on-demand instrumentation. Um, in essence, uh, when just smoke starts to, uh, when the CR starts, the JustMock profiler is attached to the CR, and uh, uh, if you are using the old approach, which is currently the default one, on JIT compilation, JustMock will insert a specific code, conditional code that actually will tell us if uh, 
uh, we just mock needs to execute some additional method, let's say, if this should, uh, this uh, multiply values should return some different uh, value or it should uh, call the original code. So uh, this code is inserted in Jint compilation and uh, this is done for every method that is uh, uh, compiled by the CLR. Uh, why for every method? Well, because we don't know uh, which method the developer would like to uh, to mock. And yeah. uh, with the on-demand uh, instrumentation, uh, what is happening is actually this line here is telling the CLR, hey, the developer is trying to mock uh, that uh, particular method. Just uh, recompile it. And uh, on that, uh, step of the process we are inserting our additional code so it's much much more faster uh, i think that it's uh, 80 or 90 uh, percent uh, better in terms of performance for the best case scenarios wow nice nice all right so you were able to run that test and yeah uh, yeah the test is executed everything is uh is uh, green and uh, regarding the generation of the uh, mock uh, arrangements so oh, if you look start, at that. yeah right if you on start the visual the, studio like the light bulb yeah yeah and if you yeah if you start the quick uh, action uh, you can uh, just uh, point to the create mock uh, you can copy the particular code and uh, you can of course paste it in mm -hmm. the uh, in the unit test that uh, you want, and uh, actually no, this is happening in what, a .NET Seven application. That's what I was going to ask. Like, what type of uh, you know app or project is this? So this is a .NET Seven uh, project with your yeah. target member. Yeah, yeah. Stick a style app. Very nice. So all of this that you are showing uh, is actually running on .NET Seven. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, really, really, yeah. Very, very cool. All right. So uh, it's uh, I uh, I'm I don't want to be in your shoes, you know, with all the C sharp changes, all the .NET uh, changes that are you know coming up uh, on the horizon. You have to be constantly updating, and you know, staying on uh, the cutting edge. So uh, good job for yeah, to you and the team. Yeah, yeah. We will uh, continue to to. Uh, invest in supporting the all, all of the new technologies that are coming up. All right, very cool. Thank you, thank you, Misha. Uh, all right, so let's do uh, the last uh, switch here. And uh, so we talked about you know uh, looking at the life cycle of things. You have to be able to debug and know what's going on in your network stack. That's where Fiddler comes in. You really have to be able to you know, step up from manual testing and do automation and regression testing, coded or codeless uh, scripts. That's where Test Studio comes in. And uh, you know, before you get to any of that, you have to be able to write unit tests and be able to mock out uh, parts of your code for you know, uh, complete coverage that you, are, that you desire. That's where mocking comes in. Uh, but enterprises also need a little thing called uh, reporting, I'm told. Uh, so, Rick, uh, if you want to come off mute, let's talk all about reporting. And I know, like uh, many of you on the call, like uh, we normally let Rick uh, and, and the reporting team, team go first, uh, but you know, uh, everybody else is on, uh, you know, um, uh, Eastern European time. It's almost dinner time. We didn't want to hold up anybody's dinner, so. Rick and me are uh, going to be a little delayed for our lunch, maybe, but uh, this is the time to talk about reporting. All right, Rick. So I think we hear you. Um, so let's uh, let's dive in. But before we go into reporting, though, we do want to know what you are up to. So a quick poll here, uh, trying to keep things interactive. We have a lot of different report viewers, right? So uh, you, it's one thing to be able to create, design, uh, and uh, pull data into your reports. But it's a whole other game trying to deliver your reports to all the users and whichever devices or apps there might be. Uh, so that's where the report viewers come in. And we have report viewers for just about everything. Uh, but uh, which one are you looking to use next? Let's say in the next like six months, if you are building an app today and you need uh, to see reports, what are you looking to see your reports in? Is it .NET MAUI? Uh, maybe it's a cross-platform desktop or mobile app. Uh, or is it Blazor or is it Angular? 
is it React? Because like we we did all of those things in the last you know, few releases. We did the React report for your last release. We have had Blazor and Angular. We have, we have had the web you know report viewer for a long time. But uh, what exactly are you uh, building that you are interested in? So let's uh, look at where you all are at uh, in terms of report viewers. Poll question going once, going twice, and let's see where you are. At. Let's see where you're at. Oh, uh, look at that. Uh, <laughs> Rick, 60% say Blazor. Wow, wow. But I am actually glad to see the Dr. Maui percentage, you know, kind of being right up there with Angular. That is really good to see. And it's something we, we're actively looking into. Dr. Maui is not out of the gate yet. It is still absolutely, uh, you know, waiting for it to be hit. Uh, GA, which is general availability, but you know, I think most developers are starting to see the promise of the new cross-platform .NET story uh, hitting native uh, mobile and uh, desktop. So that's really good to see. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe Rick, you can talk more about uh, you know, uh, you know, the latest web and but also about desktop a little bit as well. Uh, so that's uh, that's good to know. Let's see. Absolutely. Where is I was um I was surprised uh, how high Maui was on that list. Mm -hmm. Not shocked, yeah. but a little surprised. Um, yeah, I suspected Blazor would be number one, so that still holds. Indeed. Indeed. All right. With all the things reporting that you know we might be asked to do uh, for our workflows, uh, what does Telerik reporting do for us? Well, Telerik reporting uh, does pretty much anything that you needed to do in the the general scope of reporting. So. At a high level, I mean, telework reporting is a very lightweight, componentized, flexible framework for adding reporting features into a new or existing application. It's it's very .NET centric. The the core rendering engine, the, the powerhouse workhorse of reporting, is built for .NET standard um, 2.0, which is the most versatile of uh, the the runtimes. It supports on the low end uh, .NET framework for full profile and on the high end, um, at least on the high end of what's uh, what's our RTM, uh, .NET 6. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, we have um, report designers that cover um, every major scenario, whether it be a web-based designer, a platform-based designer, or an integrated Visual Studio designer, which is uh, a little more Cody for the developers out there. And we have, as, as you just talked about, a great many front end report viewers from a plain vanilla HTML5 JavaScript uh, report viewer all the way to the, um, the Blazor um, report viewer and data report viewers for um, things like uh, platform components like uh, WPF and WinForms. Uh, we have a couple, we even have a couple versions of Ajax viewers as well, um, if you're still running on a web forms application. So we really have you covered regardless of um, sort of what type of application you're building, what your frameworks are, and you really can add, you know, reporting quite easily and in the application in a very versatile way. I'm always getting asked questions, can reporting insert? You know, can reporting do this? And the answer is almost always, well, yes, you can. Yeah. And um, I'm seeing questions here in the Q&A panel that, you know, I, I promise we'll, we'll have time at the end to, you know, come back and, you know, bring Eve and Peter and Misha back on so we can, you know, dive into some more questions. But this one here is relevant to uh, something you just mentioned here. Alfred um, uh, Karn uh, was asking if there's a report viewer for straight up HTML, JavaScript and TypeScript. And the answer is yes, right? Yeah, absolutely. The HTML5 report viewer, which would be um, the one I'm using in all of my demos, is sort of the core of the report viewer library. A lot of a, a lot of our other viewers kind of use that in its core, um, and that's actually built with our Kendall UI components. So you know, sort of in the best of fashion, we're using the uh, best in class web components uh, to build our own. <laughs> Yeah, we like uh, dot, dot, build dot dot building our own things, and you know, on that point, it's it's actually great to see all of you saying, "Hey, we want uh, .NET Maui as a reporting viewer, you know, canvas." But you do have the you know the web reporting uh, canvas. You can render this on just about every web view. Uh, so uh, I mean, there isn't anything right now stopping you around, but you know, we'll definitely keep that uh, on the top of our minds. But you know, talking about uh, reporting as a solution, like it's it's like you said, like it's like it's not just one thing. It's about okay, first let's get all of our data, which could be from any variety of sources. Now let's actually build the report. Is it WYSIWYG or how much uh, control do I have standalone versus being inside of 
Visual Studio. And you know, some crazy people like to do their report designing on the web uh, in your browser. Why not? <laughs> and we can we can label that, and you can visualize it just about everywhere. And then uh, exporting is also a big part of a reporting solution, right? Because you want that you know high fidelity when you export reports out. Absolutely, it's critical in reporting that, um, especially with a, a WYSIWYG designer um, and um, perhaps uh, not uh, super technical report writers. You know, not your report writers may not be coders. It, it is absolutely mission critical that the way the report is designed, the way it looks in the designer in preview, needs to be exactly pixel perfect to how it's going to look when viewed on the web, to how it's going to look when it comes out of your printer. Um, how it's going to look when you export it to PDF or Word format or an Excel workbook. So you sort of get that guarantee baked in that regardless of the rendering format, the viewing media, the platform, your report is going to look exactly the same. It's going to have the same layout, the same dimensions, the same relative positioning and sizing. Uh, you won't have anything cut off or wrapping to a different uh, different row or um, you know, you're not presenting a, um, you know, you're not presenting a, uh, a sales report, you know, to the board where half of your sales data is chopped off on the right because, you know, your printer is a different layout, not different format than your monitor. Um, you said you get that sort of baked in, you know, guarantee with the entire workflow of reporting. Yeah, yeah, well said. And you know, on the font of uh, you know pixel perfect reporting, uh, before you try printing or exporting anything, you need to be able to build the report. And you know, that's where we come in with just about everything you can think of uh, to include in your report. Every type of you know charts and graphs and barcodes and you know tables and maps, we, we got got you all covered. You know, that, that's all kind of given when you come to us for artillery reporting. But there's also this thing called report server and I am not the one who wants to maintain a lot of things. I mean, I can, you know, run our own website uh, where I have some reporting, but can you do it for me, Rick? Absolutely, we can, we can completely do it for you. So Report Server was something that came out of a lot of customer requests for um, all I need is reporting and I don't want to build a custom application. I just want reporting and I want it yesterday. So what we did is we took our, you know, our great reporting library and we combine that with our engineering knowledge and best design practices for, for user login authentication. And we built a full, uh, full scale enterprise level sort of um, uh, soup to nuts application that you can just install uh, directly to your, your environment, whether it be uh, a cloud server or an on-prem server. And within, I mean, literally within half an hour had a full scale reporting solution up and running where you can now begin creating user accounts, allow those users to log in, connect to data, create reports, and have those reports viewed to, by end users or integrated into end applications as a, as a viewing portal. So it is a complete solution, entirely codeless. Uh, so you don't need to have any developers involved in the process at all. That's nice. That's nice. Now there are a couple of key things you mentioned in here which I uh, don't want to do as as a developer. So, like I, I get the pretty interface uh, that Report Viewer gets me, but it's that management side of things that I don't want to hand code myself. Things like you mentioned, like user roles. Like I want this number of people to have access to this set of reports and not the other ones, and and so on. So that user role and also like report. Uh, you know, the reporting business is all not not just about you know you know, creating reports is delivering reports and automating those and letting your users have the power to store reports and, you know, design their own, right? Yeah, absolutely. The the, the workflow the application uses is just as important as, as the reporting when you're building, you know, a large application like that. And the, when you have to think about, you know, can a user from group A access a report from group B and how do I insulate and isolate this data from this user now you need to get into uh, role-based user um, permissions and um, different types of authorization and authentication and implement um, you know, uh, either the identity uh, framework or OAuth or, or ADFS, yeah. federated services. And it really gets fiddly um, when you're building a large, large application. And sometimes you need to do that if you're building something custom. Um, that's why we have you know, developers and engineers in the world. Um, but sometimes you just want it done for you. And Report Server does it all for you. Um, everything is, is built. You just need to log in and, and start dragging and dropping users into the groups that you want. Um, so it takes a lot of the a lot of the hassle out of it. And then there's also 
you have to think about the report themselves as as a, you know an insular object. It's something that has to be managed. How do you when you create a report? Where do you store it? Do you store it you know in a database? Do you store it as a file? Do you serialize it? Do you not serialize it? Do you compress it? Do you not compress it? Uh, how do you upload it? How do you make sure that the, it's being uploaded to the correct location? What's the workflow for, for previewing the report? How do you manage versioning? If you have a new user who comes on, it takes your Q1 sales report and totally destroys it. Do you have a backup? <laughs> did, 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 yeah. when, you, when you built your, your upload mechanism, did you think to keep different versions in the database in case that happens? And do you have an easy way to switch back to an old version? I bet a lot of people yeah. were saying no. Um, so report server kind of has that baked in as well. You can yeah. easily roll back to a previous version of a report if, if something catastrophic were to happen. Yeah, there are lots of nuances to this. And, you know, you covered most of it. And also there's scheduling, right? Because, like, I do not want to wake up at 4 in the morning for my CEO to get a report every Monday morning. I want to be able to automate that and have the emails uh, sent out. Okay, so let's talk about what uh, you and the team did this release. Um, so, you know, uh, between... Uh, look, we do three major releases uh, every year. But, you know, in between, we also do, like, sub-releases. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the team has been super busy since like R1 of last, uh, you know, last January. Uh, so you have this concept of a universal search box. So what is this? We do. So uh, before we talk about the universal search box, let's just talk a little bit about the three different report designers. So as I mentioned, we have a Visual Studio report designer, um, which is not as used. It's a little more you know, developer centric and Cody. But we have a standalone report designer, which is a platform-based, it's a Windows pre-compiled, pre-built um, uh, designer that you can just run, download and run. And it is, uh, in, in, in my best Boston, it is wicked fast because it's running with you know native graphics acceleration directly on your directly on your machine. So it is super fast for report design. But it is an application that has to be you know, retrieve from somewhere. So um, a couple years ago, we built a web-based, entirely HTML and JavaScript-based report designer in the web. And that was a, a, a big challenge because we did not have sort of the reusable WPF design surface that we could leverage, which is a major part of a, of a WYSIWYG Pixel Perfect designer. So we had to build all of that from scratch. So for the last several years, we've been, you know, we've been saying that our major goal is feature parity between the web report designer and a standalone designer. We want you to have everything in the web designer that you have in the standalone designer. And we've been doing very, very. Well, I, I shouldn't say we, because uh, I'm not building any of this stuff. It is the um, our amazing reporting engineers who are doing all of this work and hitting all these milestones. I just get to talk about it. Um, but they have been doing a great job getting that feature parity. But um, in the last release, we decided that there are some things that are actually easier to do on the web than in a platform. And one of those is um, uh, searching. And we have great search boxes that are already included in our, our UI libraries. So we took one of those and we added it to the web um, report designer. And we realized that we could leverage that to make it super easy to look through your pre-existing reports or maybe a new report and sort of find what you need to find. So this universal search box, it really is searching everything, whether it be new components from the component dropper um, or something that's in the report itself, a text box by name or a text box by, by property. Um, it can also find uh, different properties that are available sort of in the property tree. So you're not clicking through nested properties trying to find you know where the visible property is that, that you want to find is it under style or is it under appearance you know unless you unless you found it before and you know exactly where to look you know it might take you a few minutes to find it so you can just start typing in the universal touch uh, universal search box has uh, mark first match it has autocomplete it has you know, a mm -hmm. drop down with, with um, sort of a a breadcrumb that shows you if the property is like three levels deep in a property tree um, where you know where that property is so it's really an amazing component and only available on the web report designer. So this is quite amazing. Like, you know, first up to try to even replicate everything we do in a standalone Windows desktop app on the web, you know, and it kind of speaks to the uh, to the maturity of uh, on the web today. And we actually use a lot of our components in there as well. But uh, this for the first time is like the burn here is like, you have something that is just for the web. 
uh, and that works so nicely with web workflows because that's kind of how web apps are you know used you have a search and it searches through everything like you said and it, i also like the fact that you can actually point out uh, these ones are kind of wizards and you can launch uh, that thing right from the search block itself Absolutely. You'll find the wizards, you'll find the components. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, slightly different iconography that gives you a tip as to what it is you're, cl you're clicking on if you don't recognize the name. Um, so it becomes a very useful and powerful tool after a few minutes of practice with it, you know, to find exactly what you need to find, exactly when you need to find it. This sounds too good to be true. I, I want to see this in action. But <laughs> let's talk about uh, some of the other things in here. You know, we talked about the web report designer really coming up. Uh, to feature parity with uh, the desktop uh, counterparts. Uh, you're doing everything in the browser and you know there are uh, separate sheets now you can do for you know Excel uh, type uh, you know exports uh, but uh, you are also putting a lot of emphasis on organization because that seems to be like as your reporting uh, needs grow, your your uh, you know the, your assets and the number of reports or report definitions and your data sources they're all growing together. so, how are you thinking of organization? Well, that's a that's a great point, Sam, because you know usually our demo application has maybe a dozen or so sample reports in it, but we have customers who have built one, two, three hundred reports, and having them all in a single folder um, made it uh, maybe organizationally a bit challenging. So one of the newest things we added was a folder-based organization system into both the uh, the reports path and the resource path, which is uh, part of the um, asset manager, which we we talked about in the last release, last and release. we will yeah, continue to talk about, you know, in this one because we made some improvements to that as well. So, um, but this uh, file-based system allows you to easily organize your reports within within folders, within subfolders, within sub subfolders, and then navigate that folder tree with a built-in file manager um, directly in reporting and. This is something really to show you the power of, you know, we're going to have to jump into the demos eventually to, to walk you through that. But it is um, a really great um, organizational and, and navigational feature, which I, I only expect to get better over time as we continue to, to bolt on, you know, new features to it. It is it's already, you know, has so much in there, but I can only imagine that it's going to get greater as, as time goes on. And I'm looking yeah. at your... Your, your third bullet on the slide there, the, the Kendo UI theming. For anyone who had attended the previous um, previous webinar talking about our UI tools is aware we've had a sort of major overhaul of our theming across all of our libraries to have sort of a universal theming system. Um, our, so it's now um, all our brand new, you know, sort of sassy based themes. Um, and those are fully represented in telecording as well. So basically the, various front end report viewers will be cognizant of the themes that your application is using so you'll have that same consistent styling across the components in the front end ui including you know the the report viewer and the, the theme itself yeah but i mean when you're talking about you know theming like you do want to maintain the fidelity of the actual report like the user is you know you don't want to you know maybe change up the fonts or the colors but you're talking about the presentation of the report I'm actually talking about the presentation of the report viewer. Now, remember okay. the report. The report is pixel perfect, so mm -hmm. nothing that you, nothing that the theme can do to the web application will change the report at all. That 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 breaks right. our number one guarantee sure. that 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 report that you designed is going to look exactly the same, regardless of if your developer changes the theme of the application on you. Um, the viewer itself, the 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 the, the, the um, component collection that surrounds the report for, for paging, for uh, having a toolbar for exporting and, and, um, and navigating and inserting parameters and, and uh, parameter selectors and pickers, all of that are, are user interactive, uh, interactive components that support the viewing and, and using of, of the of Teller reporting. Uh, that is what's using the Kendo, Kendo themes. The report itself has its own independent theming system to make sure that mm -hmm. It is completely insulated from whatever might be going on, you know, in your web application. Right. And, or you know, going, application. Yeah, yeah. So going back to the second point one more time, like I, I remember you showing off Assets Manager last release, and you know something that you said, like your business might have, you know, different groups or a different set of users, like you know, Group A and Group B, and maybe as a user, I want to have my set of logos and styles that are just for, you know, uh, Group A's reports, right? So. This is a way for you to kind of really organize everything, uh, not just the report definitions, but all the styles that go along with it. Absolutely. So the 
um, under the covers of reporting, we have sort of a reports path, which is a, a something that leads to where the reports are stored. But we have also a resources path, which is something that leads to the resources for uh, where things like um, data files or uh, external style files that your report is using, um, and even image assets, uh, where those reside. Uh, so they both get to take advantage of that, that folder base structure. And since these are actually different different resource paths, you're not forced to have the same folder structure for your resources as you do your reports. So you can have the as much as much or as little flexibility as you want when when, when setting this up. Yeah, well said. I want to see all of this, but uh, I think there's more uh, that you gave me here to cover. Because uh, again, you folks are way ahead of the curve here, for, even for me. And just as uh, Lucas, I'll, I'll let you uh, cover your .NET 7 preview, and then I'll uh, drop, uh, you know, behind the scenes look at how Rick and the team operate. So, go ahead with your uh, .NET 7 support. <laughs> well, of course, you know the reporting team wants to be on the the, the bleeding edge of whatever is coming uh, down the pipeline. So we're constantly testing with new frameworks and and uh, new SDKs, new runtime. And at the time of release, .NET 7 Preview 3 was uh, king of the castle, and that's what we have officially tested um, and um, are, are reporting for. So if you do want to run, you know, on the most uh, up to date um, version um, with your with .NET um, 2022 preview and uh, .NET 7 preview 3. Uh, we have compatibility for that until reporting um, and uh, sort of um, full support for it, which I, I have personally uh, tested and will be showing off. Cool. And uh, again, that's where our official support lands. But you know, Rick is. Uh, uh, wait, uh, are our cameras frozen? Uh, maybe not. Maybe it's just me. Yeah. Oh, that's not funny. I froze on uh, a closed eye. <laughs> but Rick, uh, Rick has been, uh, you know, uh, yeah, texting us late last night to say, hey, I'm, I'm you know, trying things out with Preview 4, because that's how, you know, cutting edge uh, Rick wants to be. Now, all of these uh, benefits uh, that we see with Teller reporting, do they come over to Report Server? Most of them come over to Report Server. Um, so Report Server is a broader scope than Telic reporting. So there is um, always a little, um, a little trade-off between some flexibility uh, when when we have to make sort of design decisions. So there's a lot of things that go into Report Server that aren't part of a core sort of reporting application. Things that we wouldn't give you in the reporting SDK, for example, like we talked about the user-based. Um, login, authentication, authorization, role-based user management scheme, um, but also the the uh, scheduling and data alert-driven um, uh, report rendering. All those are features that we added into the application. So they require making you know some some trade-offs in flexibility. For example, it has to run on a Windows environment because we leverage the Windows Services daemon to handle the scheduling, um, whereas that telecomporting SDK that builds your own has full support for, for Linux environments um, uh, if you wanted to build something there. And if you wanted to build your own scheduling with a, a Linux service, you could do that. But we had to make some design decisions in the application. So it is uh, all of the user end features are there. But as far as the, the architecture and overall setup, um, it, has a, it doesn't have quite the range that the reporting SDK does. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, now you can still hear me, right? I think it's just my camera that uh, froze up. Yes, yes, I can still hear you perfectly well. Your your image, okay. it looks like I put you to sleep. Uh, I'm just, you know, closed <laughs> eye. Uh, it's just too much of drinking from the fire hose, but I'll, I'll take it. But it looks like Report Server has a bunch of other, you know, enhancements on how we sort, how we are, you know, saving customizations, how we are paging through lots of assets and lots of, you know, report definitions really quickly, easy retrieval and navigation. So. Uh, yeah, good stuff. Good stuff all along uh, with you with UX. Um, so uh, I think it's time to actually see some of this in action. And let me see if uh, if my webinar uh, uh, maybe my console is the one that's a little frozen. So if if we have uh, and then you folks can do this on your own as well. If you uh, Rick want to make yourself a presenter and share screen because I think my machine sure. is uh, stalling a little bit.
Hi, Sam. Hello, hello. Hey, um, it's Rick and Sam here again. Uh, you know, technology is beautiful until it some days <laughs> falls on us. Uh, so we were uh, on our webinar and uh, we have a, we were having tech issues and connectivity issues. So we're just, you know, trying to record this and um, get back to you for the section that you really wanted. And that is Rick talking about uh, generic reporting. So Rick, I'm going to bring up your desktop. Thank you. Yes, and through the magic of editing, this should be pretty seamless when we stitch it into the into the webinar. So back where we started. Um, so telework reporting, R2, we had a lot of great features that came out. The universal search box, um, the uh, asset storage uh, and report storage organization categorization, Kendo UI theming, uh, you know, you get sassy with uh, some new themes. Uh, .NET 7 um, support, uh, official dot, officially .NET 7 preview 3, which was what was, what was out when, when this release dropped. And, um, and now on this page, but we do have a new feature in report server as well, which I will, I will show you that's built in paging. So should we jump right into some demos? Yeah, yeah, I love the fact that, you know, you are catering to organization like uh, for reporting purposes, but you're also, you know, um, you know, looking ahead at, you know, the latest in .NET runtimes, so it's pretty amazing. We're always on the, the most bleedingest of edges. It makes it a bit hard to keep up sometimes. Yeah. Okay, so I won't spend too long in the code since um, not everyone is a developer like I am and, you know, enjoys looking at this stuff, but I just want to quickly point out, you know, how easy it is to implement reporting. All this is basically in our documentation. You can copy paste into your solution and using sort of the best um, design practices from .NET 5, 6, and 7, you can see that reporting is using mineral APIs, um, dependency injection, uh, in, into the uh, into the services, um, these all of our components, whether it be the um, the uh, reporting resolver, which we're looking at here, part of the reporting core uh, rendering engine, or the front end um, uh, web report designer, or which you can see on this page, um, just a simple script, or the front end report viewer. Again, just a simple script. There's actually more comments here than actual code. Uh, all of these disparate components can be combined in a sort of mix, mix and match fashion to, to build a reporting solution. The only piece you truly have to have is the, the report rendering engine, um, which again, is just a simple, you know, standard controller implements from our report controller base, which implements the, um, the MVC uh, a, uh, API controller class. So uh, all, you know, very standards based and easy to combine and mix and match. But let's, uh, let, let's go ahead and run this program so we can see what we get on the other side. So this uh, project will, you know, load up a report viewer and uh, it's a web based app that you're showing, right? Yes, this is loading a report viewer, and let me double check something. Ah, I did it. So I don't know why, but sometimes Visual Studio, when you move your running application from one or to another, it decides to stop actually running it. Uh, haven't figured that one out yet, but OK, now we're running. Yeah, so this is our um, HTML5 report viewer, and this is actually the core viewer in um, a lot of our other report viewers like our um, Blazor report viewer and our MVC report viewers. They kind of all use this at the core. Um, so this is built using our Kendo UI components. Uh, so a lot of these uh, icons and menus and drop downs and toolbars will look familiar. And as we talked about, it, this inherits our uh, default theming. So we have like a little that little theme picker that the engineers cleverly built into this demo. Uh, so you can preview this in, in some themes. There's a nice bootstrap theme, a, um, a high contrast theme, which is, uh, I believe, ADA compliant, um, and uh, Metro Black, because we must have uh, dark mode on all the things. Um, so regardless of what sort of what theme your application is using, it'll be able to be inherited by the report viewer yes. and you'll sort of get that nice, consistent UI look and feel across your application. Yeah. You know, this one toolbar won't be sticking out like a sore thumb. 
Yeah, and like you were saying, like this does not touch the reporting itself because that is high fidelity maintained as the user had designed it. Yeah, absolutely. So let me go back to the the, the dark theme so we can see see that. So yeah, the you can see the background of the viewer, the toolbar, and all the menus are getting that theme. But the report itself, kind of the, the core principle of reporting is that uh, pixel perfect rendering. So when the report writer designed this report, they used a white background. So the report is going to have a white background, regardless of which application it's loaded in, uh, what theme that application is using, and how it's rendered. It's going to maintain that same look and feel. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the number one guarantee of reporting, that you're going to have that consistent look and feel in your reports, regardless of how it's rendered. Yep. So. Let's take a look at some of the features that we were just bragging about. So I'm going to jump over to our web report designer. Um, this is again, I don't want to search the web for it. I don't need that. It's already running. Um, web report designer. And um, this is an implementation of a uh, report designer built directly into the web using HTML5 and JavaScript. It's nice and fast and flexible. And it's, this makes it super easy to kind of expose report designing and modification to your end users. Nothing for, the, for them to download, no Visual Studio extensions. Um, they don't need a license. It's a royalty-free license uh, as part of your application. But it has the same overall um, workflow as the standalone designer. You can preview your report, see what it looks like, but you can make modifications to it. You can move things around. You can go and see what that looks like, and uh, you can make changes. Uh, I believe it supports uh, back and uh, fix things that you've messed up with Control Z. Um, so really, this is a nice lightweight designer. But I see a little thing up top. Absolutely. So let's say I don't know where something is in the designer. Um, I don't you know, know all the components in the wizards. You can come to the universal search box and just start typing. So I know I want to do a SQL query. So let's just type SQL and see what we get. And if I spell it correctly, you'll see that I get a SQL data source here. So this links directly to the, the wizard for creating a new a new mm -hmm. SQL data source. You click that and it pops, it pops right up. Um, and that would be true of anything else in the uh, in the component box. If I wanted to do a new text box, let's type text. First thing I see are all the existing text boxes in this report. Um, so these are the uh, property the property names for the text boxes that I have. They have a slightly different icon, but you also see the actual text box component. And because it's using um, it's using autocomplete, mark first match, and all those things. Next, we're going to see is the HTML text box, just because I typed the word text. That's the next closest match. And then we start getting into the, the properties. So here you can see that there's a text property on a tooltip. There's a text property on our TOC, table of contents, and the same for a document map text field. So really, it's it's cleverly finding all of the all the things that you might be looking for, and it's displaying them for you in the um, sort of the, the most likely um, item that you'd be looking for to the sort of the least likely item. So this is like kind of a clever way to, to find things. If you kind of remember the name of something, but not, you're not sure exactly what it was called, you can start typing and, and see what pops up. Yeah, and I like the workflow. Like this is very suitable for the web, uh, you know, and it launches you straight into the into the wizards. Absolutely, and even if you click on the HTML text box, it takes you directly to that section in the components where you can now just take it and drag it over into your into your report. Nice. So it's a great little workflow. And while I'm here, let's preview the asset manager which now we talked about the asset manager a bit in our last webinar, Sam. This is a brand new feature then. But what we've added now is the ability to have folders and uh, folder structures um, within your resources tab. Resources are, you know, the word for assets. So here you can see we have um, just the default data images and styles folders under resources, but you could create new folders if you wanted to. You know, for images here, you get a new folder uh, called Hi Sam. And if I wanted to put some some files in there, I could go into that folder and start uploading images or or anything I want. So into this folder. Now back in the back in the report, when I want to add something to the page, let's find a picture box. And I don't know where the picture box is. Let's search for it. Uh, oh, there we go. Found it. And you want to add something to the to the picture box under the data tab. 
and um, value property, you can see that you have um, expressions, and but you could also click and just go to your uh, asset manager, which is this icon, I believe. Yes. So here's that same folder we're looking at, and any image that I had in here would be available to use um, as a as an asset in, in that item. Yeah, this is really good for you know organizing like we've been talking about how you know you might have lots of different types of reports catering to different audiences now you can keep things very organized the report definitions as well as all the you know resources that go into each uh, into each like type of report yes exactly so here i'm going to open reports and you can see that amongst our sample reports we provide we have yeah, maybe a dozen or so uh, but I know customers that have 100, 200, 300 reports, if they were all in one folder, you know, even though we have a search box, um, if you didn't know the name of the report you wanted and you had to scroll to find it, it could, right. it could take you a while. So same thing, you could have um, different folders under reports, upload your reports directly to the, the best folder for it and have an easy way to organize, categorize, you know, and sort um, your reports. Yeah, yeah, well done. Well, I can take the credit. I'd go, credit goes to the engineering team, but uh, I will pass that along. Let's see. So what other features do we want to look at, Sam? Now, what uh, what's your runtime for this project? Where are you running this? This is local host, and what type of project is this? Oh, well, let's go back to um, our... Let's go back to our index page, because actually I prepared something. Um, just last night um, uh, for this. So this is the the report um, loader, which is something that we provide in our demos. It's a, a report that points to all the other reports. Um, but you can see that I added one other special report here down at the, kind of hiding on the bottom right. So we have an R2 surprise. So let's open this report. And I, I built that uh last night so you have to excuse the the funny images i was a little sleepy but when i um interact with this uh with this um icon let's uh what do you think the r2 surprise is going to be sam oh wow look at that so, Not even though dotnet 7 even though it's official support for preview three of dotnet mm -hmm. i actually got the latest bits dotnet 4 um uh, dotnet 7 preview 4 and updated and tested everything and you know it worked perfectly out of the box so this entire demo very was actually nice. running on preview four of, of .NET 7. very very nice you yeah, know this is the latest latest bits the absolutes the bleedingest and, of edges yeah and because you don't have to get like our official stance is preview three support but here you are trying to you know proving it out that it works on preview four as well very nice And yeah, let's see, one last thing I want to show was the standalone report. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the um, Atelic report server, which I host on a local machine on uh, port 83. So once that uh, service starts up and loads, um, we can log into report server real quick. And the new feature we added to the report server in the R2 release is the ability to um, page your various reports. So you can see here we added a pager bar along the bottom. So if you have you know many dozens of reports um, in here, it's quite simple to do some filtering and um, and do some paging. Filtering was always built in. So if I wanted to add a filter, um, I could uh, do that here to the category. But then if I still had a lot of reports, I could easily um, uh, do paging with a sort of built-in pager. Nice, nice. Yeah, it looks like I mean, a lot more emphasis being, uh, or a lot more thought being put into how people are managing these you know, big reporting solutions with lots and lots of reports and you know, assets that go with it, mm -hmm. both for uh, you know, designing as well as for you know, management of reports. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I never would have imagined, um, you know, customers having, you know, several hundred reports or more. You know, when we build these things, we tend to, you know, test them with a dozen or two reports. But, you know, then they make it into, you know, an enterprise organization and you have, you know, dozens of users, maybe hundreds of users. You, your, your reports tend to grow. And that's where we find the need, you know, we find these needs for things like paging, mm -hmm. um, folder organization. So 
the engineers are always very responsive to build out the features um, you know the customers are demanding the most. Very nice. Now, like we are very much future facing with you know .NET seven and you know up to like Preview four support. But I think there was a question about you know uh, what about like older things like can I run this on MVC? Can I run this on .NET framework? Absolutely. So the core reporting engine, um, the rendering engine, uh, Teller.reporting.dll, the, basically the powerhouse of the entire suite, is built against .NET standard two point oh. So. Okay. What that gives you is support on the on the back end all the way down to .NET Framework 4 full profile, mm -hmm. and on the the high end, uh, you know .NET Core 5, 6, 7, sky's the limit. Um, yeah. It offers you the, the the widest range of support, and that makes it you know super simple to have a single package on you know on NuGet or or um, uh, in your installer, do not have to worry about you know which version of this assembly do I need to load into my application. It's it's going to be supported you know sort of across the board. You can have that one um, rendering engine and it'll work in all of your applications. Yeah, well, that, that all, makes all of your .NET sense. applications at least. Yeah, makes sense. All right, so uh, yeah, a lot of a uh, lot of good things in this release. Uh, you know, kudos to the team and you know uh, for you to you know show off all the things here. And, uh, you know, folks watching this, um, we do apologize for the tech issues uh, up front. You know, sometimes it's not everything is in our control. But, uh, you know, thanks, uh, Rick, for taking the time out to actually come back and re-record and show us the demos that you wanted to show. So uh, absolutely. Anytime. Yeah, love it. All right, folks, that's it with the reporting uh, on to all the stuff in the, in the webinar. Thank you. Bye now. I'm looking for uh, going up to the top here of our Q&A panel, looking for uh, uh, the questions we had with uh, Fiddler and uh, reporting. And I'm sorry, uh, testing. Uh, oh, there are a lot of questions here. Uh, let's see, which ones do we want to go first? Eve, uh, do you see any uh, Fiddler questions that you want to jump on? Oh, and um, I see one here. Um, uh, Eve from Sorin uh, Boseku, uh, if I'm saying that right, is uh, is Fiddler a separate uh, subscription um, and a package and an installer by itself? Fiddler Everywhere comes as an application under a subscription model. So yes, you do have to open up um, the application. You have credentials. Um, it does, you know, connect to um, Amazon Web Services, and then you can pick a subscription model. We have a monthly and annual plan, and then we have the enterprise plan. Good to know. And, uh, you know, folks were asking, uh, Timothy Russell, uh, this relates to uh, reporting, so we'll, we'll wait for, uh, uh, you know, Rick to come back if he can. Uh, but, you know, for the first time, that search box is now only on desktop uh, report designer or, uh, you know, web report designer. So, uh, Timothy Russell was asking if we had plans to add it to the standalone uh, designer. So I think uh, you know uh, we, we we could, but again, that's it's a lot of work. Uh, so it, maybe some workflows are better suited for the web. So, but you know, tell us on feedback.tillery.com. Tell us your feedback if you would really like that to um, happen. Um, so question here for uh, Peter here. Um, Test Studio does really well if you are doing uh, WPF apps, and particularly if you're using Telerik UI. Um, what what's the story on Windows Forms? All right. Uh, yep. So I I also noticed that uh, there are so many questions. So it's a really hot topic um, here about it. So the idea is that as Litcher, as we speak uh, at the moment, the team here is actively working on introducing uh, a brand new grant feature which will introduce desktop testing meaning that eventually whatever appears and can be run on a desktop and uh, on your computer's desktop would be automated of course it's uh, such a new feature will take uh, quite some time to be um, fully introduced we're going to roll it out on uh, several stages one by one and the first one is just a month or uh, a few months uh, away so stay tuned uh, for more details uh, about it with the latest and greatest on um, Test Studio desktop um, testing feature. Oh, wow. This is uh, this is not a small announcement. This is a big thing you're dropping here. So it looks like the team is busy. 
Yep, and I'm also looking forward to the next webinar that we're going to do about it. Oh, right. nice. Because, you know, you know we, we got asked about this with uh, with reporting as well. Like, .NET MAUI is really also opening it up. So, you know, desktop apps can you know, have a fresh breath of life. So a lot of folks have been, you know, thinking of migrating to .NET 6, to .NET 7. So that's good to know. Um, Andre Panov was asking if uh, Test Studio R2 2022 will be available for downloading. I think it should already be out there in your downloads directory. But uh, Peter, you folks have a slightly different release cadence than Celeric and Ken DUI, correct? Yeah, exactly. The the features that uh, we demonstrated during this uh, webinar, the the new version of the the versioning of the translators are already available for downloading into your Teleric uh, account or with um, your Teleric uh, control panel, right? With uh, the introduction of uh, the initial rollout of the desktop testing, we'll go with uh, the next semantic version in the test studio, uh, which would be R2. Nice. Um, question here for Eve, which I am sure Eve is going to love to answer. Uh, Steven's Squares is asking if we can use, uh, you know, network debugging, uh, you know, with Fiddler for mobile devices, software on mobile devices, so mobile apps. Yes, the answer is absolutely you can. Um, yes. It is set up to allow you, you know, to intercept that traffic and acting as a proxy, it gives you that opportunity. Yeah, and I particularly like this because it's both ways. So if your mobile app is really uh, a mobile website or progressive web apps, then it's it's web traffic. We can of course do that, but it's a native app that is a problem if you are using something like you know dev tools that come you know built with some of the browsers because you can't see any of that traffic. So uh, I, as an iOS and Android developer, it's so easy for me to see the traffic uh, going through the simulators, as well as when I you know, plug in my phone, or in fact, my phone can just be on Wi-Fi, on the same Wi-Fi, as long as I'm hitting uh, a certain, you know, you know, going through uh, the IP that Fiddler, uh, you know, go, goes through, then I can see all of that traffic. So I, I really like that. All right. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of questions here. I'm trying to go through them uh, as best as I can. And uh, you know, I, I mean, our teams have been answering these questions uh, while we have been talking. Um, oh, this is a question for uh, you know. I, I I don't think I want to answer this without Rick because uh, uh, the question is about containerizing report server in a Kubernetes cluster. That is a very specific thing. So we'll we'll wait on on uh, it on Rick. Um, even Peter, anything else do you uh, you see? You feel like you know, deserves to be answered um, out loud. There, there is one question here I can shoot out for uh, uh, Test Studio with regards to mobile testing. Actually, this question always uh, quite frequently pops uh, up. So the difference uh, here is between uh, mobile with responsive testing and what actually Test Studio supports is that um, a few versions ago, we decided to shut down our native uh, mobile testing, meaning that you no longer have to install some extensions or stuff on your mobile devices in order to test your application. Rather on, uh, we decided to invest into responsive web testing. You know, uh, it means that you can uh, emulate um, literally every screen size that exists out there so that um, you can create a fully functional UI web responsive uh, test. It has the same features like the normal web tests, but allows you to check how your application would run on a mobile device, a tablet, uh, what else, fridge, watching machine, and whatever internet of things exists uh, out there nowadays. So we fully support responsive uh, web testing with uh, Test Studio. Let's, uh, let's see what's, uh, what else exists uh, here from the several Test Studio questions uh, that are here. Maybe I can share a few more with the entire audience. Yeah, there was one around uh, the differences. Thank you. Thank you for that. Between different uh, test uh, editions, so Test Studio exists like um, a small family of uh, little products uh, inside the standalone edition. It exists as a Visual Studio edition, the so-called Test Studio Dev um, edition. Um, in terms of feature-wise, uh, you have two sub-editions, which are called Test Studio Ultimate, 
which is uh, basically includes all of the features that Test Studio supports. And there is uh, web and desktop Test Studio um, uh, QA uh, edition, which uh, has uh, some of the additional features uh, missing. So we can talk about it a little uh, a lot, but I would shoot out that uh, the main differentiator here is uh, load performance and API testing on one hand and the ability uh, for you to schedule and execute your own tests uh, by yourself. This is the big picture. This is the complete um, suite of features that exist in Test Studio Ultimate and uh, some of them are not available in the rest. There is also another edition of Test Studio which is called Runtime Edition and it's uh, very important as well because the Runtime Edition, think of it as the little running agent of Test Studio that allows uh, allow you to um, install it on any Windows environment and allows you to run tests only on that environment, meaning that you cannot create tests with the test studio run edition, but you can uh, execute uh, them. Why would you need that? Well, imagine that you have a bunch of tests, like 100 or even 1,000 tests, and if you execute them on uh, one machine, physical or virtual, those 100 tests will execute one after another. But if you distribute them among uh, several machines, you will cut the execution uh, time respectively. But in order to do that, you need to install this runtime edition of um, Test Studio. Right. I think more or less we covered the, the questions into the chat with regards to, to, to our products. Uh, there are a bunch of reporting questions, but the team here, the reporting uh, team here is uh, doing a very good job, by the way, um, answering them on the spot. So the audience is in uh, good hands from what I see. All right. Yeah. That's good to know. Um, but, uh, you know, folks, uh, we really apologize for some of the technical issues. Uh, it's not us entirely because, like, multiple people are having the same issues joining the bridge. So something going on maybe on, on GoToWebinar's uh, side. But, uh, you know, we want to thank you for uh, taking, like, uh, you know, a couple of hours of your day to come and hang out with us and, uh, you know, see all the uh, all that the team has been working, you know, um, uh, Eve and the Fiddler team, Misho and the Just Mock team, Peter and, uh, you know, Test Studio and Rick and all of the reporting uh, folks. Uh, this is uh, a very critical part of, you know, any application development cycle. It's not just about the UI components we make, but being able to give you all the right tools uh, for you to debug, unit test, and mock your applications while they're being built, and also the DevOps cycles, uh, you know, making sure your apps are, you know, ready for automated testing, not just, you know, for uh, on your local machines, but uh, as well as when you move things off into a CI CD pipeline and automation uh, throughout your life cycle. And of course, for any of your reporting needs, uh, we hope, you know, Telegram reporting keeps on delivering for all of the needs that you have across different platforms and, you know, report viewers where we can de deliver reports and also, you know, the report management aspect of it, uh, authentication and scheduling and management of reports. Uh, so. We are glad uh, to be able to, you know, stand on the shoulder of giants and our engineering teams every release. And, you know, we thank you for your continuous uh, usage and, you know, talking to us, giving us feedback for the things you want to uh, see uh, more happening. So, um, Eve and Peter and Misha, uh, thank you so much. I know it's a little late for you in the evening. Thanks for hanging out with me and, you know, covering all things uh, uh, that were new and happening in this release. And uh, for anyone uh, on, in the Q&A chat room, hopefully your questions were answered. If not, you know, please come and talk to us. Uh, these are some of our social handles, but on Twitter, use the hashtag HeyTelerik, and we would, you know, love to have a conversation, get back to you, and, you know, keep that breadcrumb conversation going. So. That's it. Uh, that's it from us, folks. Uh, once again, uh, our apologies for some of the technical issues, but um, we hope you have a great rest of your day and come and join us uh, for the next release and the next webinar. So thank you all. See ya. Thanks, Sam. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.